Welcome to my webinar, The Alienation of Grandparents After Parental Separation, Strategies for Prevention and Intervention in the Preservation of Grandparent-Grandchild Relationships. I'd like to thank Elaine Cobb and the folks at Family Access for Children's Rights for organizing this important event. I'm honored to be with, with you here today, and I'm honored that you've joined me to explore what's an extremely neglected social problem that affects the lives of so many Americans and people around the globe. Grandparent alienation is a global problem that has had a devastating impact upon the lives of millions of children and grandparents worldwide. I'd like to say a few words about myself. I'm a child and family social worker and a social work professor who's worked with children and families in both Canada and the United Kingdom in various capacities for over four decades. Parenting after divorce and the needs of children of divorce has been my primary interest as a scientist and a family professional. In my research and writings, I've mainly examined the standpoint of family members who are the most negatively affected by adversarial legal systems of family separation, those who have suffered from broken attachments and whose voice is rarely heard and largely ignored in research studies. Now, back way back in 1985, I embarked on a study of the impact of divorce on non-custodial fathers and their children and what happens to those relationships over time. Although the term parental alienation had not been coined at that time, I set out to study why so many of these parents lost contact with their children after divorce. And actually in retrospect, mine was the first study to examine the phenomenon of what's now known as parental alienation. Now, just prior to my research at that time in 1985, a sociologist in the United States by the name of Frank Furstenberg had, um, uh, completed a study that revealed that fully 50% of non-custodial fathers in the United States and Canada lost all contact with their children after separation. And, uh, but nobody had really asked why that was the case. The deadbeat dad phenomenon was all the rage at that time. And it was some, simply assumed that fathers were footloose and fancy free and really didn't care about losing contact with their kids. They were happy to kind of relinquish their custody to the mother. So, but I decided to investigate that a little bit further. And the results of my research were quite startling actually, and completely contradicted what people had assumed about non-custodial dads. Far from being deadbeat dads, I found that fathers suffered a grief reaction containing all of the major elements of bereavement related directly to the absence of their children, the loss of their role as fathers, the constraints of the visiting relationship. A second finding was that it was the, the most highly involved and attached fathers before separation who were the most at risk of losing contact, just the opposite of what I have expected. And it was the fathers who played less of a role in their kids' lives, the more traditional breadwinner fathers, who were quite able to adapt to the non-custodial visiting schedule. A third finding is that fathers, well, far from blaming their ex-wives uh, for, for uh, withholding contact uh, from their children, they really attributed the blame onto the legal and judicial systems, which they felt were extremely biased against them as, as fathers and effectively removed them as caregivers from their children's lives. They, they, they uh, they were very clear about that. And fourthly, the main finding was that fathers, what I call disengagement from their children, which we now know as alienation, is the result of a combination of structural constraints, legal and the constraints in regard to their ongoing involvement in their children's lives and their own psychological response to the loss of their children, both psychological and systemic factors were implicated in their uh, disengagement from their children. Now, 25 years later, I replicated that research to see if the situation had improved for fathers at all. In fact, it had not. It had gotten worse. In that intervening 25 years, fathers were now playing a much more active role in the lives of their kids, and they were being much more negatively affected by the loss of their children after separation. So what was 
what I found to be in 1985, a, a grief reaction of fathers was now a full blown post-traumatic stress reaction uh, with dire consequences for fathers. Now, um, since then, I've been among the first to study the impact of divorce on non-custodial mothers, another neglected group. But I've mainly focused on the perspective of children who've been robbed of the love and nurture of one of their parents after separation. I've also done a lot of research on family mediation and the working methods of family mediators. It's one of my areas of interest as well. And, um, and also I've done a great deal on shared parenting as in the best interest of children after separation as an alternative to the present sort of system, adversarial system. Um, shared parenting is the foundation of family law. I was the inaugural president of the International Council on Shared Parenting Organization. But I'd say parental alienation is the main focus of my work these days. But I'm also one of the first people to have studied grandparent alienation. At the time that I completed my non-custodial father study, I became aware of paternal grandparents' precarious situation. When or eliminates contact between a non-custodial father and his children, the relationship between the grandparent-grandchild generation is also likely to be drastically altered. I realized that as fully half of non-custodial fathers become absent in their children's lives, and because paternal grandparent contact is highly dependent on ongoing contact between non-custodial dads and their kids, the incidence of paternal grandparent disengagement is also likely to be high. So after publishing my non-custodial father research and having heard from many grandparents, I embarked upon a study of grandparent alienation. The results of that study were published in 1995. Now, um, the purpose of my presentation today is to, first of all, introduce you to the core issues respecting grandparents who are alienated from their grandchildren or under threat of alienation, where the grandparent-grandchild relationship is threatened or perceived to be threatened. And secondly, I'd like to consider practical strategies for prevention and intervention in cases of grandparent alienation. This presentation will be in two main parts. The first is the alienation of grandparents from the lives of their children, the theory and, and knowledge foundation in that regard. And second is more practice oriented strategies for prevention and intervention in these cases. At the outset, I'd like to note that grandparenting today consists of enormous variations. Whereas most grandparents have a relationship with their grandchildren, a recent study found that 10% of grandparents today have no contact with their grandkids. It's probably an underestimate. The role of grandparents in society has undergone a profound shift to the extent that some grandparents choose to remain less actively involved and, and, uh, in their grandchildren's lives, while for others, grandparenthood is the most important part of their identity and the most important co component of their everyday lives. The erosion of grandparent-grandchild relationships has been largely overlooked in research, despite the fact that the importance of the grandparent-grandchild attachment bond is otherwise the subject of much academic and professional discussion. There are actually very few studies of grandparent alienation. In the divorce literature, attention is mainly focused on the nuclear family and its members. The experience of grandparents and other extended family members affected by divorce has been neglected by researchers, despite the fact that the family therapy literature has devoted a great deal of attention on multi-generational approaches to working with families. Now, given this neglect, grandparents have begun to organize themselves around the issue of protecting their ongoing access to their grandchildren based upon what they perceive to be their special and unique status as grandparents. The proliferation of grandparents' rights groups 
concerned with withheld access to grandchildren suggests that the alienated grandparent phenomenon may be much more widespread than previously believed. Members of these organizations see themselves as only the tip of the iceberg, as a voice for a much larger group of grandparents facing the issue of lost or threatened contact with their grandchildren. I'd like to begin to examine this issue by briefly looking at some of the current trends and patterns in grandparenting. First of all, we know that as older persons now live longer and remain healthy for a longer period of time, they're more likely to become grandparents and maintain that role for a prolonged period. Nearly 70% of, of older people in uh, North America are grandparents. And usually they have contact with at least one grandchild. Based on current life expectancies, many will be grandparents for at least 20 or 30 years. The reciprocal significance of the grandparent-grandchild relation, relationship has become a popular subject for social scientists. Family systems theory has helped to foster a greater appreciation of the complexity of intergenerational relationships as family counselors and therapists are increase, increasingly including the grandparent generation in multi-generational family therapy and counseling. Child development theory has concluded that the grandparent-grandchild relationship has the potential for affecting the development of children in a unique and significant way. Role theory has ascribed multidimensional roles for today's grandparents, historian, role model, mentor, nurturer, and great parent, an ultimate support person in familial crises and transitions. In the research, grandparents are described as providing a source of unconditional love and companionship to their grandchildren, acting as emotional buffers and mediators between children and their parents, being the purveyors of family traditions, providing children with a sense of roots and identity. Also, grandparents are seen as contributing to child development by providing respite care for parents. Grandparenting roles can take on added significance during periods of family crisis and transition. During and after divorce, for example, grandparents can provide reassurance, continuity, stability, and emotional support at a time when parents may not be as emotionally available to their children, and, and a sanctuary and a source of support otherwise not available to children. A Canadian study examining the extent of grandparent involvement and its impact during parental divorce found that more than three quarters of children had actually lived in the grandparents' home during or after their parents' separation, and that grandparents played an important part in assisting children's adaptation to the consequences of their parents' divorce. Now, as I mentioned at the outset, there's a great deal of variation in grandparent-grandchild relationships which is a function of geographical proximity, age of grandparents, health status, social class, ethnocultural affiliation, and age and gender of grandchildren. There's also a discretionary aspect to these relationships. It's not uncommon for grandparents to involve and attach themselves differentially to grandchildren using what's known as a selective investment strategy that provides them with an opportunity to enact the full range of grandparenting roles with only some of their grandchildren or with just one. However, given the heterogeneity of grandparenting roles and with grandparents maintaining different kinds of relationships with different grandchildren, for many children and grandparents today, the grandparent-grandchild attachment bond is very important and an important part of their self-identities and a significant factor in their lives. And even with varying levels of involvement in their grandchildren's lives, grandparents' emotional attachments to their grandchildren generally prevail over all other aspects of their lives. The nature of grandparent-grandchild relationships is largely shaped by the kinds of relationships that exist between grandparents and their adult children and children-in-law. The significance of parents' mediating role in grandparent-grandchild relationships is especially evident during times of stress in the family, 
such as during parental divorce, especially when grandparents become triangulated in the marital dispute. Despite what's known as the norm of non-interference in parent-child relationship, Evidence suggests that grandparents often support the position of their own children in cases of parenting disputes during divorce, and as a result may become closer to their own child, but isolated and estranged from their former child-in-law. Where their child is the custodial parent, their level of involvement with their grandchildren is likely to increase. However, when the child-in-law is the custodial parent and their child well for their continued contact with their grandchildren. Divorce significantly alters many grandparent-grandchild relationships. Now, contact between first and second generation in-laws, which are known as affines, is substantially reduced, whereas relationship between first and generation cosanguines usually becomes closer, especially in the case of mothers. Now, as mothers become tend to become uh, not become the custodial parents after divorce, contact after divorce between maternal grandparents and grandchildren often increases as grandparents assume a parent-like role in the children's lives. Fathers are typically non-custodial parents after divorce, and paternal grandparents' contact with their grandchildren is usually highly dependent on the level of the father's contact with his children. There are actually variations for and circumstances surrounding grandparent-grandchild contact loss. But parental divorce remains the primary circumstance that threatens ongoing contact between grandparents and grandchildren. Paternal grandparents are much less likely to remain in contact with their grandchildren than maternal grandparents after divorce whereas maternal grandparents report either no change in the relationship or more contact and greater emotional co closeness with their grandchildren after divorce, paternal grandparents are much more likely to report loss of contact. Grandparents of custodial mother children see their grandchildren more often because they represent important resources and support systems to the middle generation. The literature has identified a number of other factors influencing the level of grandparent contact with grandchildren. Younger grandparents are more likely to remain in contact, whereas older grandparents, especially those in poor health, have less contact. Grandparents who are geographically distant have less contact. Grandparent alienation can also occur as a result not only of divorce, but in situations of conflict with one's own adult child or child-in-law in an intact marriage situation. Death of one's adult child, step-parent adoption, or children living with neither of their biological parents. These patterns have been noted in various studies of the grandparent role in recent years. I mentioned these patterns as important background information to the research on grandparent alienation, which is quite sparse. So, what is grandparent alienation? Well, I've provided on the slide three definitions. The first is adapted from Jennifer Harmon's work. Grandparent alienation is the unjustified rejection of a grandparent by a child, which in the child's views, in which the child's views of the grandparent are almost exclusively negative to the point that the grandparent is demonized and seen as evil resulting from a campaign of denigration or brainwashing by the alienating parent or parents in which the child allies with the parent or parents. My own definition um, of grandparent alienation is the programming of a grandchild by the parent or parents to den denigrate the grandparent in an effort to undermine and interfere with the child's relationship with the grandparent. It does not pertain to those cases where a child has been victimized by abuse and the child is fearful of the grandparent as a result. And taken from the parental alienation study group, the two main features of grandparent alienation are the child's unjustified rejection of and refusal of contact with the grandparent and the parent's abusive strategies to denigrate the grandparent. 
In the assessment and diagnosis of grandparent alienation, five primary factors need to be present. One, the child refuses contact and expresses hatred or indifference toward the targeted and rejected grandparent. Two, there was a prior positive relationship between the child and the now rejected grandparent. Three, there's an absence of abuse or neglect by the targeted grandparent. Four, there are multiple alienating behaviors by the alienating parent or parents. And five, there are behavioral manifestations in the child, such as denigration of the targeted grandparent, weak or untrue rationalizations, a total lack of ambivalence, absence of guilt, borrowed scenarios from the alienating parent, false statements based on false beliefs that are based on false memories. As I mentioned, there are four primary circumstances associated with grandparent alienation, and those are parental separation, conflict with both parents, death of an adult child, and finally, step-parent adoption following remarriage. And again, I would stress that in particular, paternal grandparents are at high risk for losing contact with grandchildren when the child-in-law is the custodial mother. So I'd like to begin by examining the research data that does exist regarding the grandparent, uh, regarding grandparent grandchild alienation and report the results of a study I undertook in Canada, which involved interviewing 55 grandparents in depth who've experienced alienation. And then I'll talk a bit about the findings of the latest international research. So there's a gap in the research on the issue of grandparent access and the problem of alienation from their grandchildren and the difficulties that grandparents experience, whether as results from divorce or other circumstances. My research was intended to fill, begin to fill this gap. As my main source of data, I decided to target five so-called grandparent rights groups in five Canadian cities. Some of the groups were relatively well established, while others were just getting off the ground. Some of the groups, yeah, um, uh, the, the, the groups were spread right across Canada. I chose to interview members of grandparents' rights groups in the first instance, as they're a group of highly vocal grandparents who are able to bring the issue into clear focus. The 55 grandparents were members of these organizations who'd experienced access difficulties at some point in their relationship with their grandchildren. My goal was try to try to get a clear picture of the phenomenon of grandparent alienation and to pinpoint the core issues. So I collected data on the nature of grandparents' involvement with the grandparent rights organization, uh, various aspects of the grandparent-grandchild relationship before, during, and after access difficulties, their reasons for access difficulties, and the impact of lost grandchild contact upon the grandparent. In the great majority of cases, grandparents were able to recall information in vivid detail. Some of the grandparents represented the problem-oriented uh, side of things, while others were positive about the fact that previous ac access difficulties had now been resolved. Some were looking for a normalization of their experiences, while others were looking to give vent to their feelings. Now, consistent with earlier reports in the literature, when asked for their definition of grandparenthood, a wide variety of functions were identified by the grandparents I interviewed, with most of the grandparents describing a multiplicity of roles. Grandparents saw themselves as a source of care and unconditional love, a source of play and recreational activities, being able to in invest time and attention to children in a, where, in a way that parents often could not, as purveyors of family traditions and providing stability and security to their grandchildren. Above all, they stressed the specialness of the grandparent-grandchild relationship. From their perspective, the grandchild, grandparent and grandchild bond is one that's highly salient and unique. 
I asked the grandparents what they felt were the circumstances surrounding their loss of contact with their grandchildren. Well, 75% reported that access difficulties were the result of one parent withholding access, such as after the divorce of their child, or as a result of a step parent withholding access or the death of their adult child. So 75% of the access difficulties were one parent withholding access. The rest were the result of both parents withholding access. Two thirds of the grandparents I interviewed were still experiencing problems. One third has achieved some measure of resolution of these and were now at least in regular contact with their grandkids. A small number of grandparents, in fact, had legal custody of their grandchildren at the time of the interview. I found that in divorce situations, the likelihood of reestablishing contact with grandchildren following an initial period of access difficulties appears to be much higher than in non-divorce situations, those being intact two-parent family, denying access, or death of one's adult child followed by denied access. The prognosis for reestablishing contact appeared to be very poor if grandparent alienation was, was the result of both parents withholding access in a two-parent family situation, or if access problems occurred after the death of one's adult child. It's very difficult for a grandparent to overcome access difficulties if there isn't at least one parent who supports contact. The encouraging thing is while divorce is a significant factor in grandparent alienation, grandparents may be able to renegotiate grandchild contact and aren't necessarily powerless in this regard. In divorce situations, the relationship can be restored in some cases. But I should emphasize that even in divorce situations, in the majority of cases, 20 out of 34 of the parents I interviewed severe alienation occurred. The rate of severe alienation, however, was, was lower for divorce as opposed to non-divorce cases. In non-divorce cases, only three of 18 were able to reestablish contact. So I'd like to look at the divorce cases in my sample of grandparents first. In the great majority, actually 90% of divorce situations, the adult child-in-law was female, a clear indication that paternal grandparents are at especially high risk of losing contact with their grandchildren when the mother is the custodial parent. Grandparents were asked what they perceived to have been the reasons for the access difficulties and the alienation they experienced. 80% identified the discouragement of contact by their adult child-in-law. Grandparents were also asked how their adult child-in-law had, had discouraged contact. Outright denied access was mentioned by 80% of the grandparents. 50% cited a variety of more subtle and indirect means, which made the contact awkward or strained. 30% cited the relocation of the child-in-law and grandchildren, or lack of knowledge of the grandchildren's whereabouts and 20% cited the constraints of highly controlled, restricted, or supervised visits. Most grandparents identified a number of ways that contact was discouraged rather than just one. But what seemed to stand out was the frequency of outright, outright denied contact. I also found that in divorce situations, the level of the child-in-law's encouragement of contact was a significant fact factor in ongoing grandparent contact. That is, alienation was very likely to continue if the in-law, not one's adult, own adult child, discouraged contact. The adult child-in-law, rather than the grandparent's adult child, is the immediate grandchild relationship, or lack thereof. In 19 of the 20 situations where grandparents continued to experience access difficulties after divorce, the child-in-law was the custodial mother. In contrast, in non-divorce situations where grandparent alienation occurred, the in-law was more likely to be male in 9 of 15 cases, in fact. 
The consequences of alienation for grandparents were quite profound. The great majority of grandparents described experiencing a grief reaction containing all the major elements of, of bereavement re related directly to the absence of their children, the, the, role, the loss of their role as grandparents, and the constraints imposed on them in regard to contact with their grandkids. Grandparents were also asked about their experiences with legal and therapeutic resources. 56% of this group of grandparents had at some point consulted with a lawyer regarding access to their children. 30% had some form of therapeutic contact, and 6% had consulted with a family mediator. Legal consultation tended to be accompanied by therapeutic contact. So those who saw a therapist were more likely to have also seen a lawyer about their difficulties. But please note that this group of grandparents are likely not representative of the general population of grandparents in regard to lawyer and therapist contact. Both legal and therapeutic help were associated with positive outcomes in terms of the reestablishment of the grandparent-grandchild relationship. So those grandparents utilizing legal and therapeutic resources had a higher likelihood of reestablishing contact with their grandchildren than those not using these resources, who are more likely to become alienated from their grandchildren's lives. Interestingly, however, grandparents generally did not consider recourse to the legal system to be a good way of resolving access disputes. And this included many of those who had made use of the legal system and who had achieved what they considered to be a successful outcome. They felt that the legal system ignored the emotional elements of the problem. And they viewed legal resolution as an adversarial and damaging process and identified mediation and therapeutic resources as a better alternative. So what conclusions can we draw from these findings? First of all, a dominant theme that emerged was grandparents' grief response related directly to the actual or threatened loss of contact with their grandchildren, containing all the major elements of bereavement. This suggests that following a period of access difficulties, there may be powerful psychological factors at work which may weaken grandparents in their negotiation of and demand for grandchild access and may be a contributing factor to their eventual alienation. Grandparents will not show up at a mediator's or lawyer's office during the early stages of loss of contact with their grandchildren, but this is not necessarily a reflection of their emotional attachment to their grandchildren or level of emotional distress over lost contact. Rather, it's much more likely to be associated with a profound and unresolved and debilitating sense of loss and grief, and a sense of what I would call learned helplessness. The effects of sudden grandchild absence and cessation of the previous grandparenting role will be especially debilitating for those grandparents with previously intense attachments to their grandchildren. For previously highly involved and attached grandparents, the experience of an abrupt uh, discontinuity in their relationship with their grandchildren is likely to occasion an intense grief reaction. In response to contact loss, grandparents locate themselves at various points of the bereavement continuum. Numbness, shock and denial, anger, rejection, betrayal, hopelessness, depression, or, or else increased motivation to restore contact and eventual resolution of the access problem. Many grandparents, actually a third of my sample, were able to restore regular contact. But resolution of the grieving process may be particularly problematic for those with previously intense attachments, as reactions of intense grieving are more likely to characterize these grandparents who continue mourning and become stuck along the bereavement continuum. Grandparents spoke of the profound difficulties they experienced in the early stages of loss of contact with their grandchildren which often coincided with the separation or divorce of their adult child. They spoke of experiencing tremendous difficulty assimilating the reality of these events, the multiple losses they were experiencing all at once. In addition, the so-called norm of non-interference, non 
may further limit the extent to which grandparents experiencing loss of contact with their grandchildren feel able to insist on their rights of access. Concern about interference in their grandchildren, in, sorry, concern about interference in their children's affairs results in considerable reluctance on the part of many grandparents to insist on grandparent contact in the initial stages of contact loss. Concern about antagonizing parents and thereby jeopardizing ongoing contact with grandchildren serves as a catch-22 against grandparents. Early action toward ensuring access may antagonize the parent who may then completely withhold access. On the other hand, inaction in the initial stages of contact loss might jeopardize future contact. This double bind situation is particularly pronounced during the divorce of adult children. There are few social rules or traditional models guiding grandparents as they enter the uncharted territory of negotiating new post-divorce relationship with their children, former in-laws, and grandchildren. Secondly, the data reinforce the centrality and very power powerful position of parents as gatekeepers of the grandparent-grandchild relationship. What's been largely overlooked in previous research, however, is the fact that it's the child-in-law, especially the custodial mother in divorce situations and the father in non-divorce situations, who is the primary mediator of the relationship. 80% of alienated grandparents identified the discouragement of their child-in-law as the main reason for their lack of contact. And 80% of these grandparents referred to outright denied access by the child-in-law. Most grandparents lose contact with their grandchildren as a result of the divorce of their adult children. Again, although my research showed that there's a significant number that lose contact in non-divorce situations, two-thirds were associated with divorce. In the great majority, 90% of divorce situations, the adult child was male and the in-law female, reflecting paternal, the, re, reflecting the preponderance of maternal custody outcomes in the divorce population. It's clear that paternal grandparents are at especially high risk of losing contact with their grandchildren when the mother is the custodial parent. Existing studies often fail to recognize the intractable nature of post-divorce conflict between many former spouses, often resulting from an adversarial process of child custody and access determination, and the spillover effect on first and second generation relationships. They also fail to recognize the father absent after divorce. The prognosis for restored contact for following a period of access difficulties is not altogether bleak in divorce situations. Contact loss in non-divorce situations in intact two-parent family situations or following the death of one's adult child is likely to persist. There's a much higher likelihood of overcoming the problem in divorce situations. Many grandparents are able to negotiate or otherwise deal with the initial access problems and restore contact with their grandkids, but a large proportion do not. Finally, the actual extent of grandparent alienation that's reported in the research may actually be underreported. The actual level is something that's very hard to ascertain. This may be because grandparents find it difficult and painful to admit to and talk about the loss of such, primary, such a primary relationship in their lives. Those grandparents who have in fact been successful in negotiating continued contact may exhibit a greater readiness to talk about their relationship with their grandkids and avail themselves for research purposes. Alienated grandparents are likely to be much less visible and more reluctant to open up wounds. Such grandparents may also be less likely to make use of traditional legal and therapeutic resources when experiencing access difficulties, although they're beginning to make use of grandparent support groups in this regard. So that's the research I conducted. As far as more recent research is concerned, studies on grandparent alienation have in fact been few and far between. 
And the, the few studies that are out there have used very small samples, usually no more than 12. Usually it's grandmothers, self-selected samples, and they restrict themselves to describing one particular aspect of grandparents' experiences. Grandparents' experiences with alienation have been somewhat a minor sideshow when it comes to parental alienation research. One recent study, for example, dismissed grandparent alienation as, quote, collateral damage. But there's been a small resurgence of interest in grandparent alienation actually just over the past year. An interesting study from Australia came out this year focused on grandparents' perspectives of alienation, of alienation behaviors on the challenges that, a grandparent, that alienated grandparents are forced to endure. This study built on a recent article I published with Jennifer Harmon on parental alienating behaviors as a form of domestic violence. The grandparent alienation study interviewed 12 Australian grandparents with little or no contact with their grandchildren about the tactics used by alienating parents. The researchers found that the alienating behaviors experienced by grandparents were very similar to those reported by targeted parents in parent alienation research. And these are, on this slide, you can see these are the main alienating behaviors experienced by grandparent, by alienated grandparents. The most frequent in 10 out of 12 cases, there were 12 uh, uh, grandparents in this particular study, 10 of 12 reported controlling contact, dictating the extent of contact, limiting visitation or changing their minds about contact, monitoring phone contact, using the court system. One grand grandparent said, we felt as if we were just puppets and she pulls the strings. A second tactics, nine of 12 grandparents identified brainwashing, telling the grandchildren their grandparents didn't love them anymore, providing one-sided accounts of events that were untrue but believed by the grandchildren, being taught to hate or fear the grandparent. A couple of quotes here. I don't think they know what's real anymore because they're told so many stories. Another grandparent said, uh, the, the mother says, those presents are only to buy your love. It's made to be something bad. They're seriously brainwashed. It's like they're in a trance. Another tactic was banning information. Eight parents identified banning information, triangulating third parties, to prevent medical, educational, and other information from, from being communicated to the grandparents. Seven identified rejecting gifts and cards given to the grandchildren. Grandparents not knowing whether their gifts were received, destroying gifts. So here's one quote. For some years, I sent birthday cards and Christmas gifts. There was never any acknowledgement that they received them. After a number of years, I couldn't actually give them gifts that were thoughtfully chosen because I didn't know who I was buying for anymore. Six uh, parent, grandparents identified false allegations, claims of assault, and the difficulty to disprove allegations in the context of grandparent alienation. Quote, I had to write an affidavit of what happened after my son got a lawyer's letter saying I had assaulted her. Another quote, there's nothing you can really do to unmake it. No defense is good enough. Four grandparents identified denigration, bad mouthing by the, by the alienating parent. Quote, she started telling the children the most terrible stories about me. Four cited interrogation, questioning after contact or after visitations, which would be used to fabricate stories. Quote, in the end, they were nervous wrecks. They were different children. Four identified secret keeping, assisting the, the, or insisting that the children maintain secrets, including any aspect of their life involving the alienating parent in their day-to-day -day life. Quote, they were told not to talk about family business to anybody and definitely not to me. So it made any kind of conversation really difficult. Four identified manipulation when the family is still intact. Manipulation often occurred before family separation with the alienating parent fabricating stories and using them to isolate family members from each other. Three grandparents identified emotional manipulation, suggesting 
For example, suggesting that the parent will withdraw their love and contact with the child if they pursue a relationship with their grandparents, adopting an us versus them mentality. So one quote was, if she was to dare to suggest that she wanted to see us, then she was doing so of her own free will and she would be punished, have her phone taken away, given the silent treatment, not talked to for days on end. In the end, it got to the stage where it became impossible to maintain a relationship at all. Another grandparent stated, with alienation, it seems to be you're with me or you're against me and the children are put in that position. They either have to go, go with that or deal with absolute torment. Two identified social media blackout, contact blackout with grandchildren through social media platforms. Two identified encouraging disrespect, which is encouraging children to talk back in a disrespectful way at odds with their previous behavior with their grandparents. And finally, one identified threatening correspondence, receiving uh, phone calls, letters, emails, and texts that were of a threatening nature. Grandparents experience these alienating behaviors as a type of family violence, and it affects them deeply. They describe the alienation as a primal wound. And they're acutely aware of the negative effects the alienation is having on their grandchildren, especially in cases where a close bond had previously existed. This violence primarily involves the alienating parents' use of control to force the child to conform to their desire to hurt the targeted grandparents. This demand forces the child to choose between aligning with the alienating parent for maintaining a relationship with the grandparents. So they're effectively forced to act in a hostile manner toward their grandparents with whom they previously had a loving relationship. Being forced to hate their grandparents has profoundly negative effects on children. And the grandparents remain in a state of constant anxiety, knowing that the alienating parent can terminate the relationship at any time. One of the, the most insidious tactics used by alienating parents, by alienating parents that I uncovered in my own research was the use of triangulation. That is the alienating parent turning grandparents against their own adult child. This often involved making grandparent visits contingent on grandparents blaming, denigrating, and disparaging their own adult child to the grandchildren or making absolutely no reference to their adult child as a parent and undermining their adult child's role as a legitimate parent. Most grandparents rightly refused grandchild contact under such conditions, but it's a terrible double bind forced onto grandparents, forcing them to choose between their own child and their grandchildren. And in my opinion, this is a particularly egregious force of family form of family violence. I'd now like to turn to the second half of my presentation, strategies for prevention and intervention in cases of grandparent alienation. I've divided this part of the presentation into three parts, prevention, support for grandparents, and multi-generational family mediation aimed at reunification. I'll start with prevention. Prevention begins with education. Learning about the core elements and dynamics associated with parental alienation and grandparent alienation, um, learning that you're not alone, that grandparent alienation is a phenomenon which has affected millions of children and families worldwide. The best way, in my view, to prevent grandparent alienation is to first address the problem of parent alienation, which in a previous talk here, I described as requiring a multifaceted approach, as parental alienation is a complex social problem created largely by adversarial legal systems of family separation. And our solutions need to be both individual and systemic, both macro and micro level interventions. In my last talk, I described the need for a four pillar approach to addressing parental alienation. Many alienated grandparents channel their energies into addressing these four initiatives. Recognition of parental alienation as a form of family violence, warranting a criminal law response. Recognition of parental alienation as a form of child abuse, warranting a child protection response. Reform of family law 
in the direction of establishing a legal presumption of shared parenting, because shared parenting is a bulwark against both parental and grandparent alienation. And finally, treatment, establishing a network of family support services to assist families in the separation transition, keeping grandchildren's needs and well-being at the forefront. These are all needed reforms in the area of parental alienation. Finally, in regard to the prevention of grandparent alienation, is the importance of grandparents taking the high road in regard to maintaining good relations with adult children and children-in-law as gatekeepers of grandparent-grandchild relationships. By this, I mean being supportive of both parents in their parental roles, avoiding taking sides in disputes, and generally not getting caught up in conflict with either their own adult children or with their children-in-law. I'd like to talk about support services for grandparents at risk of alienation. Challenges faced by these parents are many, as a kind of learned helplessness can easily set in. It's important for grandparents to avail themselves of support services wherever possible. First are legal supports. Grandparents do have legal rights, but the extent of these vary from one state to another. Legal systems often lose sight of the well-being and best interest of children caught in the middle of parental uh, of, a, of an alienation situation. Despite the rhetoric of the best interest of the child in legal proceedings, my best advice to grandparents would be to proceed with caution as far as legal intervention is concerned. At the same time, keep in mind that extreme grandparent alienation may be a form of family violence, and family violence is a criminal matter. Next are therapeutic resources, including both reunification, programs, and therapeutic supports and services for grandparents and their grandchildren. As is the case with parental alienation, intervention in cases of grandparent alienation is a very sensitive matter. Reunification efforts should, should be undertaken with service providers with specialized expertise in parental alienation reunification. Alienated children seem to have a secret wish for someone to call their bluff, compelling them to reconnect with family members they claim to hate. Despite strongly held positions of alignment, alienated children want nothing more than to be given the permission and freedom to be loved, to love and be loved by both their parents and extended family members. I hear from many alienated grandparents. The main message I give them is never give up. In the face of rejection from your grandchildren, always respond with loving compassion, emotional availability, and total safety. Patience and hope, unconditional love, being there for your grandchild is the best response that you can provide, even in the face of the sad truth that this may not be enough to bring back your grandchild. While professional service providers, such as lawyers and family counselors and therapists, can be of great benefit to grandparents at risk of alienation, mutual aid self-help groups can be vital to grandparents who are feeling isolated and alone as they struggle with the fallout of grandparent alienation. Finally, I'd like to talk about a promising intervention that's unutilized, but holds tremendous promise as an alternative to legal intervention and also to traditional therapeutic intervention in cases of grandparent alienation. And that is multi-generational family mediation aimed at grandparent-grandchild reunification in cases of alienation. I'd like to make two points in regard to mediation. First, when divorcing parents come into mediation with child custody disputes, especially when there are established positive bonds with the grandparent generation. It may be useful to involve family members, fam or rather family elders, the grandparents, in the actual mediation negotiations. There will be instances where this will be helpful and instances where it, would, would, where it won't be helpful, but it should be considered. Secondly, mediators, have an important role to play in the resolution of access disputes between grandparents and parents 
regardless of the circumstances, whether it's divorce or other circumstances sur surrounding broken contact between grandparents and grandchildren. As legal remedies have largely proved to be unhelpful in this difficult area, this may be an important opportunity for the mediation profession to have a strong and positive impact. And this represents an as yet largely untapped area for mediation. Given grandparents' reluctance to utilize adversarial means to deal with access difficulties, family mediators may be instrumental in providing alternative mechanisms to deal with impasses as they occur. So I'd like to conclude my presentation by proposing for your consideration two potential approaches or models including the grandparent for including the grandparent generation in family mediation. So divorce is the main circumstance associated with grandparent, grandparent alienation from grandchildren. My position is that disputes between grandparents and adult children about grandparent grandchild access are appropriate for mediation in many cases. And this represents a largely untapped area in the field of family mediation, given the increasing numbers of such disputes. If mediators are to address this issue, they first of all need to adopt a more inclusive definition of the family system. Specifically in regard to the post-divorce family, mediators need to be aware that new roles and relationships need to be negotiated beyond the so-called binuclear family to include the extended post-divorce family, including grandparent adult child relations, grandparent in-law relations, and grandparent-grandchild relations. This perspective assumes that given the opportunity to be involved in mediation, grandparents who are included are likely to become important resources both in the mediation process and as supports to children adjusting to the consequences of their parents' divorce. Grandparent involvement can thus be framed in a positive way. A multi-generational model of family mediation would include grandparents in both the assessment and intervention stages of mediation with the divorcing couple. A case can be made for such a multi-generational multi approach to family mediation from several perspectives. Family systems theory has fostered the development of multi-generational family therapy models recognizing the importance of intergenerational relationships during periods of stress and family reorganization. Role theory has ascribed many roles for today's grandparents, including supportive functions during divorce. Child development theories have identified grandparents as significant and important attachment figures for children. And attachment theory tells us that where the bond is significant and positive, an ongoing and healthy grandparent-grandchild relationship can lessen much of the negative impact of divorce on children. A multi-generational divorce mediation model would include two basic stages in which grandparents could be considered and perhaps directly included in the negotiations. First is the assessment or the pre-negotiation stage. As part of assessment, it's important to assess the nature of the child's relationship, relationships with not only grandparents, but other members of the extended family and significant others, but especially the involvement of grandparents, attachment of grandparents with grandparents, the influence of grandparents. This should be part of the beginning stage of mediation. A recognition that grandparents may be instrumental in ameliorating the negative impact of the divorce. Assess to what extent this case, discuss ways of providing for this. A, media, a meeting with the mediator may be helpful with both sets of grandparents. And assess each parent's level of comfort with ongoing grandparent contact and extent to which they will facilitate the continuation of the relationship. That's often an issue that's neglected in mediation meetings. The second would be then the intervention stage, which is comp comprised of three sub-stages. The first is an education phase where the mediator talks about the importance of preserving important relationships for the kids, including grandparent relationships. The mediator, the mediator would reframe grandparent-grandchild relationships in a positive way. 
would talk about the role of grandparents during after divorce as supports to children and parents, and discuss, discuss the possibility and nature of grandparents' involvement in the mediation process. Second would be the negotiation phase. Grandparents may be highly beneficial in the negotiations. Their presence may be an important support both to the parents and the mediator. Grandparents don't necessarily have to be present for the negotiations, but their level of future involvement needs to be considered in the parenting schedule negotiations. If there's a conflict between the parents in regard to grandparent involvement in the children's lives after divorce, this needs to be put on the table as an item for negotiation in the mediation. Parents may not have considered this as an issue, but it could become an issue in the future. And the mediator's job is to identify that as a potential problem in the future. Particularly if there's a sole custody arrangement, it's important to determine the level and nature of future grandparent contact. And finally, the follow-up phase where the mediator helps the parties anticipate future difficulties and possible sources of friction and to be available to parties if future difficulties incur, occur, and that includes grandparents. Mediation of disputes between parents and grandparents regarding access to grandchildren in non-divorce situation, situations. Reestablishing contact after a period of access difficulties in non-divorce situations is really challenging for grandparents. As grandparents begin to use legal means to reestablish contact, however, mediators may be called upon to help resolve these types of access disputes. These can be highly complex situations where in some cases there may be good reason for denial of access to, to grandparents. Also, forcing grandparent access over the objection of a parent or parents may be seen to be undermining parental authority and autonomy over children. Nevertheless, uh, there may be circumstances in which uncovering the respective interests of the parents and grandparents and assisting in their mediation negotiation may result in a positive outcome for all parties and overcoming the access disputes. Through screening and examination of parents' stated reasons for denial of access, um, a thorough, rather, sorry, a thorough screening and examination of parents' stated reasons for denial of access is important, as are grandparents' motivations for contact. To assume that grandparent contact necessarily benefits children misrepresents the heterogeneity of parent grandparenting roles. But if there had been contact in the past and the nature of the grandparent-grandchild relationship is positive, then um, this indeed uh, could be uh, an appropriate situation for mediation. Children's needs and wishes need to be considered. And the nature, again, the nature of the parent grandparent relationships need to be explored. If there's a high level of contact, which is level, which is likely to persist, if there's not at least a potential of restoring some level of harmony between the parents and the grandparents, exposing children to the conflict needs to be carefully considered, is this a good idea? But like in interparental conflicts, parents and grandparents can be instructed in ways of keeping their previous conflicts separate from their children. There's a great deal of potential for mediation in the area of grandparent-parent disputes, where there needs to be careful assessment of situations where it's appropriate and desirable and situations where it may be contraindicated. Restoration of the grandparent-grandchild relationship in non-divorce situations is most likely to be successful where there's, first of all, evidence of a prior close relationship. Secondly, evidence of ongoing benefits to the children, the provision of love, affection, and caring. And thirdly, a non-conflictual relationship between the parents and grandparents, or at least the potential for restored harmony. And that possibility is enhanced when uh, mediation is available as an alternative to adversarial means of resolving disputes. So to conclude, 
the case for ongoing grandparent involvement in the lives of grandchildren has been made clear in the research literature. Child development experts are agreed about the importance for the child to maintain meaningful post-divorce relationships that are beneficial, and that includes grandparent relationships. Secondly, grandparents may be the most important source of support to children and also to parents during divorce at a time when parents are overwhelmed by the multiple transitions and stresses they're facing upon divorce are relatively insensitive to children's emotional needs. Grandparents can be the safety net in the family during divorce. In studies of grandparent alienation, both research and clinical studies have identified the importance of enhancing the quality of life of all divorced family members, including grandparents who've been largely ignored or excluded in therapeutic programs for divorced family members. The importance of including grandparents in mediation, divorce and post-divorce counseling and family therapy. We need to expand our definition of the post-divorce family system to include grandparents and extended family members and to expand the use of intergenerational therapeutic approaches and mediation with the post-divorce family. The problem still exists that many grandparents do not initiate a request for help, although self-help groups are beginning to make a difference. Part of the reason for grandparents' reluctance may be that their needs are rarely addressed in divorce and post-divorce counseling and therapy and family mediation. The main concern for grandparents after parental divorce is that of access to their grandchildren. How best to work with this concern? Empowering grandparents in relation to access. Educating parents in regard to the importance of grandparents to children's well-being during and after divorce. Educating all family members in regard to guidelines and expectations for behavior after divorce that will be acceptable to all. Encouraging mediation as an alternative to litigation, especially in regard to negotiating access. So to conclude, I'll, I'd like to leave you with these final words. They're exactly the same as I made in my last presentation with one additional point. The true measure of a nation's standing is how well it attends to its children, their health and safety, their material security, their education and socialization, and their sense of being loved, valued, and included in the extended families and societies into which they were born. Second, it's the responsibility of grandparents to support both parents in the fulfillment of their responsibilities to their children's needs. And that includes their needs for meaningful caring relationships with their grandparents and extended family. Finally, uh, I would highlight this point again. Shared parental responsibility, a legal presumption of equal shared parenting is the most effective method of prevention and intervention to address grandparent alienation as a form of child abuse and family violence, and is commensurate with the well-being and best interests of children and their families. Thank you for your attention.